welcome to the Liz Earle Wellbeing Show. I am Liz Earle and I'll be speaking with leading experts and familiar faces from the world of wellbeing to bring you wellness wisdom you can truly trust. From fitness to gut health, mood to menopause, you'll quickly learn how to spot a gem of wellness wisdom from a passing fad. Now, I have just had the pleasure of chatting with Julia Samuels. She's a grief psychotherapist who's been working in the NHS and in private practice for 25 years. She's the author of Grief Works and her latest book, This Too Shall Pass, Stories of Change, Crisis and Hopeful Beginnings. We had a fascinating chat about what she calls living losses, the periods of change and discomfort that we all experience throughout our lives, from navigating emerging adulthood to learning to live with an empty nest, finding yourself plunged into menopause to the abrupt advent of retirement. Julia shares her wisdom for any of us struggling to navigate periods of change in life and cautions against leaping to the next step without giving ourselves time to embrace what she calls the fertile void. I'm so looking forward to hearing your thoughts on all we've discussed on Instagram after the show. And don't forget, if you'd like to watch our chat, you can now find full video podcasts over on the Liz Earle Wellbeing YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's get straight into the episode. So Julia, welcome. Hello, Liz. Lovely to be here. It is really, really nice to have you. And your background is so extraordinarily varied and so interesting coming from, I know you, first of all, from what was Birthright, which became the wellbeing charity. Absolutely, yeah. Child Bereavement Trust and your counselling work. Am I right in saying that it started counselling parents who had lost babies? Yes, yeah, so my first job was at St Mary's Paddington, where for 25 years I supported families where babies and children died. And that's where I sort of got all my learning and um, experiences, which is, you know, pretty much at the deep end of... Gosh, of that is doesn't get any life. harder, I wouldn't think. Did you start as a psychiatrist or a psychologist? I'm a psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. So my first... I had an interview from about eight people. Of doc- it was my idea to do it because I I realised from when I was at Birthright that families at St Mary's, if they had a baby that died or a child that died, they saw the doctor at the six-week check, but they had no other support at all. And we know from research, um, and this is true for any loss, whether it's a, a death or a living loss, the thing that predicts your outcome after a loss is the love and support of others at the time of the loss and afterwards and so age kind of blissfully ignorant aged um, 35 I said you know I should come and do this and they literally put me in a broom cupboard and quite against it they paid me almost nothing but then I kind of built a relationship with them all and trained the staff and the practices in the hospital so that the families got better support and I mean I loved being part of the NHS I loved being Mm. part of something that was bigger than me and with working with the doctors who are amazing people, you know, and the nurses and the midwives. Mm. So that was a real kind of... It must be time. very hard for, for doctors and medics who are all about healing people and making people well and presumably have very little training in what happens when the ultimate outcome is not a good one. Absolutely right. So, you know, doctors go into the profession to make people better. And often if you look at the profile of people in all of the helping professions they will have had some experience in their life that will have drawn them into that profession. So it, it's something personal too that will have led them to want to do it. So to have to tell a family that, you know, the devastating news that their child is dying or has died goes against everything that they want to do. Mm. Um, and so big part of Child Bereavement UK was training um, doctors and midwives and any healthcare professional or teachers that came into contact with families about how to communicate, because it's you, the thing that people need is um, to know that you care right. and that you're willing to listen. Um, they need your compassion mm. because you can't fix this. Mm. And I mean, that's true. So in my new book, This Too Shall Pass, which is not about death, but about living losses, about the mm. transitions, you know, we don't have control over lots of our of the things in our life which we want to have control of. And actually, I think particularly in the 21st century, we we have this full sense of our own agency. 
um, that, you know, we can make anything happen because we can do an ACADA order, we can book an aeroplane ticket and, uh, and a car all within two minutes. We kind of think, well, I'm the master of the universe. So that when, <laughs> when events happen, you know, like we're sacked or our partner wants to divorce us or um, even wonderful things like getting married or having a baby, we sort of think, oh, I'll just snap out of it. Yes. You know, once, once the thing is done, um, I'll, be, I'll be fine. But actually the adaptation internal process of change, the transition process, which is like grief, it has the same feelings as grief, um, takes much longer. Yes. And of course, the intensity of it will depend on how big the change is. Mm. But I think we expect ourselves to sort of work like machines. Mm. And, you know, we are evolutionarily we're, not machines. We are not. And it's very interesting, that whole process and your background, having started focusing very much on bereavement and grief, and then this phrase, which is new to me, that you talk about now, these living losses. And it came because, you know, for 30 years of my practice, anyone who came through the door, whatever their presenting issue was, it was change that they had a problem with. Mm. And they expected themselves to be able to just switch into this new thing that had happened to them or just aging or, you know, whatever phase they were in their life. And then they felt that they were doing it wrong. And the thing people tend to do when they're in difficulty is that they turn on themselves and they have a very loud, what I call shitty committee, where they attack themselves in all sorts of different ways, where they're mm. telling themselves to get on, stop making a fuss. And really what they need is self-compassion and understanding and the patients to know themselves, not distract themselves and listen to what is going on and respond to that. And the other big thing is that because the transition takes longer than we wish or want it to, we often hasten the next step. And what I talk about in the book is that we need a fertile void. We need this space between an ending and a new beginning. A kind of time of limbo, of experimenting, of not knowing, of testing out. So how does that work out. in practice then? Give us an example of that. So, I mean, you would know in your own life, the minute you have finished a book, somebody will say to you, well, what's the next book going to be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally a week later, it's yeah. published. I mean, uh -huh. my book's coming out next week and all I've been asked isn't about this book, it's about, well, what's your next book yes, going to be on? One. <laughs> and so I need a phase of a fertile void to, um, well, I need to launch this book and give it mm. its full kind of capacity, if you like. Yeah. And then I need time to kind of read and write notes and go for walks so does that and apply in in everyday life as well everyday life so yeah. and, and you talk about living losses i was very struck by when you said about having having a baby for example yeah which you think well that's such a joyful time you know you become a new mother maybe for the first time and yet that's a time of change and transition and it is a really joyful time and so the thing that i kind of want the message i want people to transmit or me to transmit for them to hear, is that it's both. So you have this miracle and love and connection and the, all your whole kind of oxytocin going crazy in your body with the bonding and looking at this baby that you cannot believe that it's such a miracle. And at the same time, and kind of often hitting against it, it's like, oh my God, I mean, I haven't even been to the loo. Yes. I, haven't, I haven't had time can't brush my to hair. talk to a friend. Yeah. I can't brush my hair. I'm not in charge of my day anymore. I'm sleep deprived. Me and my partner can't talk to each other anymore because all we we had just take turns. So whose turn is it to have the baby? Or, you know, it's your blooming turn to go and get the food. So there's a huge adaptation process, which unfortunately pain is the agent of change. Discomfort at the kind of easy end and pain at the other end because when everything is the same and familiar, it doesn't send little probs, pro, pro, probes, is that the word? Yes. Prods. Yes, it doesn't prod. <laughs> it doesn't prod <laughs> of disquiet to say, oh, oh, something's happening because you can just breathe easy. But a little prod of disquiet tells you, oh, I need to adapt. I need to change. And yes. as a mother, that's an ever-changing process, isn't it, from being a, a mum to a new baby where you yeah. kind of learn to be totally relied on to when your child leaves home, hopefully, which 
many more yes le- yeah. young people are not leaving home or they're they're bouncing or back leave, home yes yes <laughs> and going yes like rubber balls boomerang they, they, yeah they come yeah. back but that is another process of change isn't it I and mean, i've got a lot of friends who this whole empty nest syndrome is is very real and having spent their entire lives devoted to bringing up their children are now going through massive change. Massive change. And it's often when their parents are ill. Yes. So they may be looking at the loss of them and often when they're menopausal. Mm. Um, so they need to kind of really... And then they think, well, come on, there's nothing wrong with me. I want my children to grow up and be, you know, get home. And yeah. I, I know the menopause, you know, I should be fine. Yes. But actually they need to kind of give themselves time and understanding and find out what is going on inside them to give them information to make informed decisions. Mm. Because when we're in a panic, we tend to kind of make um, flip decisions. That's very true. Or we, or we turn on ourselves. Mm. You know, when we're worried, we're not necessarily our best selves. So we get cross with everybody. Yeah. You know, we may start drinking more. We'll do things. We'll get sort of super busy about everything. You yeah. know, start tidying our drawers, yes. um, doing everything to distract yourself. And really what your system is telling you is, look, hold on, something big has happened. Give yourself some kindness. Give yourself a bit of time and work out what this means for you in the present and the future and the recalibration of the relationship with your child, which is Mm. really important so that there's that negotiation of parenting where... You know, you don't want to overparent when they're in their sort of late twenties or mid twenties, but you also don't want to abandon them. So, how do you recalibrate it so you let them learn to be interdependent and adult in their world, but you also stay close and connected? Mm. And how is that generation below us? I mean, my eldest child now is heading for thirty, and the landscape now seems very different. From when I was that age, you know, when I was 30, I'd had an established career, I'd had a couple of kids, you know, and a mortgage and, and all of that. But that that seems to be quite different now. Do, do we see that the millennials are having their own crises, if you like, of, of where they are? Well, there's a phrase which is the quarter life crisis. Quarter uh, life crisis. Yeah, which is like the midlife crisis, but the quarter life crisis. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of reasons for it, which are that job security is much less certain, finding a job even in the first place is much more difficult. They're much more emotionally intelligent, much more emotionally aware generations, so they're able to say what they're feeling and what they want in a way that we wouldn't have even known that it was a word. But also what um, an American psychologist called Jeffrey Arnett talks about is that there's this new phase which is emerging adulthood. So in the 70s, they coined the term term teenager. And what Jeffrey Arnett talks about, because the younger generation have had more parental attention than any children in history before them. Is that so? Yeah. More parental hours. If you think about how you were as a parent or are as a parent and how you were parented. Yeah, and I was left alone by my parents. Exactly. So, (laughs) I mean, parenting wasn't even a noun. No, it It wasn't. You didn't talk about parenting. Roof over your head, yeah, food what, on the what, table. What more do you want? Get yeah. on with it. <laughs> and then your and your personality is fixed. Yeah, like this is who you are. Yeah. Get on. And once you're eighteen or even younger, I left home at sixteen. Yes, yeah, um, bye. Mm. You know, I've done my job. Yeah. And we are, you know, we have conversations with our children in a way that we never did with our parents. And you know, there's the extreme end of helicopter parenting where our kids don't learn enough to fall over and pick themselves up and be resilient. Mm. Um, but anyhow, so so they have great strengths because they've been loved and um but they because of the, also not just because of the parenting but because of they've been educated for longer because of the economic and political climate has influenced them i mean 911 had a big influence on that generation mm. um they and they voice much more what they feel and what they need. Yes, that is true. Um, yeah. And of course, they have social media. Yes, I was going to say social media. What changes is that playing into our society and, and your work? Because you've you know lived through all of that working for well decades. Yeah, and but just to finish with with young people is that they, I think, rather than criticise them for being what they're like, mm. is that we need to listen, because I think they have a lot of emotional intelligence. Um, to tell us but also I think we 
they will also need to have the skill of adaptation even more than we've had because they're going to have a multi-phase life. You know, we had a three-phase life where you were educated, you work and you retire. They're likely to have three or four jobs at a time or they're going to have to do a job, leave, retrain, have a time out, work again, and they're going to be working for much longer. So their whole framework of what life is going to be like is going to be completely different to us. So our job is to support them, to enable them to manage that rather than expect them to be yes. like us. That's really fascinating, isn't it? Because it's no point in us saying, well, of course, when I was your age, you know, I'd, I'd left home and had a job and, you know, so you just get on with it because the landscape is so different. I've never actually thought about it like that. And there's more been more societal change in the last 50 years than ever before as well. So all the sort of institution structures that gave us rules and guidelines like marriage institutions or the church, the boundaries are broken down and everything is more fluid so that there's more fluidity in sexuality, gender, relationship, work. Mm. And in some ways, that's really exciting and it gives us lots of choices. And in another way, it's absolutely terrifying and creates an existential yes. crisis. Yes. You know, I mean, I think... Um, books like Jordan Peterson's 10 Rules of Life, why it's so popular is because it's like the Ten Commandments. If you do yeah. this, Live like then you'll, this. Be, you'll be OK. Yep. And actually what I hope in my book is that by reading the case studies of people who are rich of real stories, um, plus all the research and the reflections, people will find for themselves their own rules and guidelines mm -hmm. for their life. Because we do need an internal structure. We need a kind of understanding of who I am and what I need and what my values are and what gives my life meaning and purpose. And so I create my own limits. I think we, this thing of being completely boundaryless in so many different ways really makes us feel very kind of thin and scared. Yes. And that we need to create our own st structure and boundaries for ourselves that work for ourselves. So how do we make our own boundaries then? Because I, I always think of boundaries as something that's imposed by other people, imposed by restrictions of work or my parents giving me boundaries. How can I, as a middle-aged woman, make my own boundaries? Well, I mean, I think... Of a, so a boundary is a limit where you set a limit um, for yourself of how close someone comes to you or what you're prepared to do for somebody. A, a boundary would be a yes or a no. So it, a lot of people feel now that they can't really ever say no because they need to please other people. And... When I have that with clients, I say to them, you know, if you always say yes, I mean, if you always, yes, if you always say yes, what's it worth? Because A, you'll always be the person that they go to because you say yes. But, you know, you, you have no value because you're, you're just wearing yourself out with the thinness of your yeses. And you don't enjoy it because you're resentful, muttering in your yes, head, sure. that bloody woman she's asked me again. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think the... I feel like I'm banging on forever. But anyway, this is a big book. Um, I think the biggest breakdown in boundaries is work. You know, nine mm -hmm. to five doesn't exist anymore. No, it doesn't. We live in a 24-7 culture. And, you know, work has become, you know, it's where you do spend most of your hours. And so one of the boundaries I create with clients is an end to work and then transition into home, that it may be only just a 10 minute walk that you get off right. the tube, mm -hmm. you turn your phone off, yes. you do a breathing exercise, you kind of put your work down and you consciously, yeah. intentionally stop your work and you step into the house. And you may even have five minutes when you go home before you see who's at home, if, if you're lucky enough to have someone living with you. Mm. And that you then have your home life. Yeah. Because this bleeding of work into home often means people have their sort of shit partner and shit work yes. because self, really because true. they're so yeah. exhausted and yeah. it's you lose yourself. I think it's very hard also if you're self-employed because A, you've got the pressure of um, having to perform because that's, you know, you think there's always that worry. Well, you know, if they've asked me and if I can't do it, then they're going to ask somebody else and never ask me yeah, again. Yeah. And often if you're somebody who works at home, and that's that's more, I think, the case for women, um, is, you know, your home is your office and your office is your home. And how then do you shut the door on it or, or clear away the things from the dining table and and start start afresh? But we need to create that boundary, don't you we, do. for ourselves? And I think you I think it is much more difficult 
and that and there are very real financial concerns so i'm sure. not saying ignore the reality that it's a very competitive world and you want to make sure that you're you're sort of out there but i if you you know research shows that even if you take 10 minutes out and walk around the block mm. and do a little sort of breathing exercise your concentration is improved when you go back yeah and the thing about sort of computers and iPhones and social media is that they're so addictive yeah. that you kind of lose yourself and you lose your hours and who yes. you are oh my into goodness. the machine. You go down a rabbit you hole and for hours, don't you? <laughs> and you don't really yeah. concentrate that well. No. So if you come back, yeah. you know, going outside is always good. Mm -hmm. So it's taking mini breaks as well as your, I think everyone needs their own toolbox. Mm -hmm. So in my book, I have the eight pillars of strength which are things that are sort of habits and attitudes and behaviours that help you kind of set ground rules for yourself in life. And some of them is your relationship with yourself. Some of them is your relationship with others. Some is your mind and body. So, you know, exercise is probably the best mental health thing yes. that you can do. Yes, I totally agree. Um, structure, lots of different things. But each of us needs to have our own little box that we kind of use for ourselves mm. that is flexible and adapts mm -hmm. because, you know, this too shall pass. Yes, this too <laughs> shall pass. I love it. I, that's just such a great expression to hold in your head, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's a very, I, it's very grounding just to always be able to say to yourself in any situation, big or small, this too shall pass. I mean, I, I woke up this morning in a panic because it, it's the launch next week and I've got to do tons of events and stuff. Mm. And... Um, I made myself and I really felt like this hot kind of burning thing in my chest. And I just thought, why have I written a book? <laughs> <laughs> the book's fine. I wanted to write it, but the, yes, you know, talking everything that goes it. with it. Yeah. And I um, put some calming music on. I went for a run. I did the 7-11 mm. breathing exercise. You What's know. the 7-11? So if you um, breathe in for 7 and then you breathe out for 11, it winds your system down because the the 11 um, triggers the parasympathetic, which is the wind down part of your right. body. And the seven breathes in the sympathetic. And how long so, do you have to do that for? Two minutes. Really, that's all? Yeah. Just seven, 11? Yeah. Oh, it's so and then that's why I walked here because I thought I've just got to get that out of my system. Yes. Yeah, walking stuff off is great. Yeah. I do love that. And walking and talking. So, you know, I think therapy, if you're in crisis, is is really helpful, important, but probably going for a walk with a good friend yes. or your partner or your children. Yes. That thing of being in movement together, not eyeballing each other, mm -hmm. but talking about how you feel and then you can have a space. So that my children, when they're cross with me, they come up to me and say, Mom, let's go for a walk. And I slightly go, oh, shit. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. But I, that's how we work it out. Yes. So they they start off by being cross and they tell me what they're cross about and then I might get cross or I might be a better mother than I am at other times and really yeah. listen. And, you know, so by yes. the time we've come back and however big the problem is, is the length of the walk, we, we've we we've um, repaired it yes. and we have a hug and then we might have supper or lunch. And that is the key in conflict is it isn't that you're cross with somebody or that you need a fight. It's the capacity to communicate and then repair after a fight. Mm. So if you're kind of in a family, in a functioning family, so a whole section of my book is about families mm. and functioning families and dysfunctional families. And the key, the difference between functional and dysfunctional is that in a functional family, you believe everyone is on your side and that they're for you, that you're part of this team and the capacity to communicate honestly with each other and know that what is being said and that how you feel is valued. Mm. Um, and, of course, love. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying love like it's a small thing, but yes. a big part of it functioning. Because most families, whether they're dysfunctional or functional, love each other. But how you do the loving, how you do the sort of family structure makes the difference. And how do you advise families then who have a dysfunction? So one of the things that I'm really interested in to look at in a family is um, family systems through generations. So what we understand from families is that what difficulties can pass down transgenerationally from person to person and what the research shows is that 
those things that haven't been dealt with in the previous generation are transferred to the next generation until someone's prepared to feel the pain. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So would that be a sense of, um, I don't know, aggrievement about something or... It could be a a fight about money between two brothers who are the grandfathers and they're now uncles. It could be, I mean, a very obviously much more well-known one is Holocaust survivors. Mm. So there's transgenerational trauma that is transferred to the children and the grandchildren. So those parents never talked about what happened to them, but it was transferred physiologically in the systems Mm. of their children and their grandchildren. So transgenerational children of survivors have many more um, digestive disorders. Do they really? Yeah. And than presumably, the and, and, and you would be seeing people now, and you'd be yes. unraveling stuff from generations. Yeah, yeah. In my beyond. in my first book, Grief Works, I had someone who whose father was a um, Holocaust survivor. But also, it can be things like a suicide, mm. or a stillbirth, yeah. or a divorce that was very shameful. Divorce was so shameful. So, you know, every family have their stories of loss and broken relationships and difficulties. Yeah. And what the research says is that if you want to know and live your pre- your present life in the present for the future, you need to know where you've come from and what those stories are. So does that mean perhaps sitting down talking to parents if they're still with you? Yeah. And having maybe difficult conversations yeah. or, or just sort of generally Being saying... Being curious. Yeah, asking Tell me. questions. Yeah. yeah, how was it with your mother or how was it with your grandmother? Yeah. And you can have a genogram. You can buy these books of genograms where you look at patterns in families. So recognizing patterns of are there patterns of separation and divorce? Are there patterns of families not talking to each other, of fights? And you begin to recognize what has come down to you kind of in the system that you didn't even sort of very consciously know that was there. So there is an unconscious bias or influence that's happening throughout a family as a thread that you might not be aware of. Totally unaware of. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? I mean, I I bet if you looked at your family and... Now my mind is thinking. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to get one of those books. I'm going to fill it in. It's really interesting. And I've worked with people with genograms and the stuff that comes up and how they go, oh, my God. That explains that it. That makes sense. Yeah. I never understood why I dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Always got furious because we tend to get angry when we're a bit scared. Yes. Um, so when people are in a process of change, they're not necessarily their best selves. You know, they're often more angry, they're more difficult, and then they get the opposite of what they need. So they le- need love and compassion. But they can't get it. But they're being they're... tricky and annoying, and so everyone just leaves them alone. Yes, and then it's self-fulfilling, and self-fulfilling. then they become more... I hate everybody. Yes. Nobody understands me. How can we make it easier for people, then, that we're close to in our families who are having difficulty with change and feeling angry about it? I mean, it's... It's the same stuff. It's it's telling people what's going on. Mm. And I think probably the secret weapon of communication is the capacity to listen. I think, you know, we, particularly now with social media, everybody is transmitting. Yes. And so they are transmitting louder and shoutier and louder and not really enough people are listening. Mm. And with within families, it's really the capacity to listen and listen actively with all of your body so listen with your eyes listen with your senses listen with your heart as well as listen with your ears and not be thinking about what you're going to say while they're talking to you but actually take on board what they've said and often reflecting it back as sort of I was just about to say that that was something that I I learned from from somebody um, talking about counseling is that when somebody says something to you maybe about a difficult situation or about how they're feeling you then reflect it back and you say, so from what I'm hearing you say, you're feeling this or your observation is that, is is that right? Yeah. And then they feel safe with you. And it's, yeah. and they, it lets them know what they're feeling. So as, you know, why therapy works is that as people are voicing what's going on inside them, they kind of recognise more clearly for themselves what's going on in themselves. Because while it's in our head, it's like a sort of whirlwind that's going around like a washing machine. But as you give yourself the time and attention to go in and work it out, you find a, a, a narrative for it. You find a story and you begin to make sense as you're speaking like, oh, I felt that and then that happened and that's why I did that. So you understand it for yourself, but it's still quite fragile. 
when you reflect it back and say, well, what I've understood you to say or what you've just said is, or can I just check this? Mm. You go, yeah, 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 that actually, yeah. yeah, that is what I said. That is what I meant. Well done, you. <laughs> and it kind of gives you confidence in yourself and it builds that sort of foundation of trust in yourself that you can trust what's going on in you. Mm -hmm. You can believe what's going on in you. And you have this capacity to make sense of it for yourself. And that gives you enormous resilience um, going around your world. Yes. Now, we've mentioned the, the, the SM words a couple of times, social media. What is your view as a therapist? Is it something that you're wary of? Do you embrace it? I mean, I think it's part of our life now and you can't kind of put it back in the box. The thing that I'm very interested in, and I think people don't know at all, um, is that your social media profile and your posting um, has become a big part of your identity. And what I understand about identity is that uh, when you ask the question, who am I, identity is where you find your answers. And there are lots of aspects of and different identities that form the foundation of the self. So there's fixed identity like your race. And then there are changing identities, which could be your gender or your sexuality or your status as a single or married or your job or your religion. So you have identities at the heart of change. But the core aspect of identity is the need to be to be loved and to belong. And if you're have that sense of identity that you're lovable, valued, and you belong, that gives you self-esteem and confidence. Does that, are you yes, with me? This I'm is totally quite a you. long explanation. Mm, no, it's fascinating. And then we know from evolutionary science that for identity, um, we needed to uh, be unique and, and um, stand out in order to attract a mate. So you need to be different to attract a mate. But also from evolutionary science, we know that in order to be safe in the tribe, you need to belong. Because if you are expelled from the tribe, yeah, you are in, in danger. Yeah. So you, you know, get eaten by the land or whatever. And what I feel is that people are putting core parts of their identity out into the wild west of social media in the hope that they're going to get this sense of love and belonging. So part of the tribe, I'm part of the gang, I'm the cool and I'm one, special. I've got loads of likes, everybody Look at loves me. my pictures. Yeah. But it isn't proper sense of love and belonging. It's, it isn't real. It's not real. No. <laughs> and so unless you have the other foundation stones of your identity well protected and looked after, you suffer. Because if you, um, if your identity is threatened and you don't feel that you belong, and you feel that you're not getting light. And also it's very addictive. So, yes. you know, as we talked about before, it's it's a game so that the, the, the apps are set up to make you addicted to it so that you get a little hit of dopamine. So you keep looking to be liked, you keep looking to belong, and you, however much you get, and you may have, you could have 100,000, 200,000 followers mm. and, you know, 50,000 likes or whatever it is. Yeah. It doesn't do it for you. And no. so then it sets up this awful needing cycle where people really suffer. And presumably younger people, because they, as they're developing their identities, they're, they're investing so much time and effort and value, placing value in this. And what's really mattering for them behind is, is that the security of the reality of the platform is just not there. Exactly. That's And then it just comes right. crumbling down. Absolutely. And... This thing with the young people of their identities are forming, as you said, at that point. So they're very fragile. Yeah. They're very vulnerable. You know, and we've seen all the rates of suicide, eating disorders for mm. young people are rising exponentially. It's, it's frightening. Mm. And I don't think it's all social media. And I think there's a lot to be said for social media. Yeah, there's you know, some good stuff. Too. There's some really good yeah. stuff. So I'm not against it. I just don't think we know enough about how to protect ourselves and look after ourselves. Again, boundaries. We don't yes. know enough about boundaries yeah. in social media. Yeah. You talked about rates of suicide, and I was quite shocked that, that one of the highest rates happens in menopausal women, early 50s. Do you know, I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought I knew everything about that kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a real shocker. And as, as low levels of estrogen plummet and, and anxiety and depression, 
right. and they can go untreated um, or misdiagnosed by by doctors. Um, do you see significant numbers of menopausal women? I know you've touched on it in the book as well, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. And I think there's that perfect storm that can develop when women lose their sense of identity. They're losing their looks, perhaps. They're, they're not losing... looked at in the street anymore. No, and their hormones are letting them down, so they may feel more anxious. They, they may get dumped by their husband or partner for a younger model. Do you, what sort of advice can you give to women who may be listening right now who are in that situation? I mean, you're an amazing um, sort of wave, a flag carrier for menopause that it needs to be talked about yeah. um, much more and that taken in a way more seriously, not just this thing where you have a hot flush and you get over it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's you know, way more than that. It's yeah. laughed at, isn't it? Like, it is. stop making a fuss. Yes. Um, and I think some of it is women themselves taking it seriously. Because I think what is so difficult about menopause is that at the very point where you need to be kind of valuing yourself and have a resilience of self-esteem is when through the hormones that you, you have no choice over, it's incredibly depleted. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, the, the difficulty is that you the, the, the blood tests don't always give, no. perimenopausal don't always give you your answers do no. they and so they say you're not menopausal it's something else yeah you have to be really guided by by your symptoms um and and be prepared to push for for, for proper treatment um you know and replacing hormones and that kind of thing but what can you say to women who you know who are left by you know husbands maybe of 30 years how, how, how do you pick yourself up after a situation like that that must be just so devastating? It is, is it a question of this too shall pass? I think, I mean, you always when there's a devastating um, loss is you have to acknowledge the loss. You you can't come in and fix it with a sort of, don't worry, you'll find someone else. Right. You, okay, you know, that's not helpful. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Yeah. No, you have to say, I'm so, you have to acknowledge what's happened and say how sorry you are. And then be a really good friend that shows up. Yeah. That you, because they need your love and connection. You know, when love dies, it's the love and connection to others that enables us to survive. And so if your partner of a lifetime has left you, so much leaves you as he walks out the door, your sense of safety, mm. your sense of value as a woman, your status as a married woman, um, probably your financial security, maybe part of your social network, your friendship group, everything how you see yourself. And, you know, in my um, case study in the book, what she found was that when she went out and saw her friends, she was treated differently. So there's like this hierarchy in social life that when you're a couple, you're seen as stronger and you're given more attention once you're a single woman, somehow you're, and you're an older woman, so you're yeah. not kind of up there pulling, as it were. Right. You're seen as a threat to the married couples, but also you're treated like, can you be the one that can go and pop into the kitchen and, um, you know, fetch the fizzy oh, water? Gosh. And you're given, when you stay, this one, she was, <laughs> she used to be in the spare room when she went to stay with this, these friends. Yeah. And the next time she went, although the spare room was empty, she was given the child's X room with the Batman wallpaper. No. So she had lost her kind of her status, status and standing within the, the yeah. friends. That's so key to be aware of, because even if you know we're fortunate enough to be in a stable relationship, we are all of us going to be aware of women who are either widowed or divorced or, you know, separated or never married or, or, never married or whatever, going through those sort of life stages. And so to be aware of this, to be a bit more aware of it and be prepared to give them the love and the self-esteem and... And people say to them, um, oh, Diane, sorry, I can't ask you because I've got so-and-so couples coming. Oh. You know, I'll, I'll take you to a movie. So, you you know, they, they're treated... They the odd woman, the spare woman. Yeah, who's sort of diminished in, in their value when they're so diminished already. Yes. Um, so I think being... So for them, being and aware for the, of it's really important. And for the women, it is to let themselves mourn. You know, so it's grief with all the feelings of grief. And so allow themselves to feel the pain, allow themselves right. to be angry. Don't just say to them, oh, come on, it's fine. Yeah. You've got to put on a brave face. And, because it's a, like... by allowing yourself to feel the pain of it that you heal. So by allowing the process of the natural feelings 
that go through your system and they often hit you like a wave and they pass down like a wave is that's how you adapt so to support yourself in that process and not block it because if you block it they get stronger and it's more intense but also you narrow your emotional bandwidth so if you have pain this end and joy that end when you block pain you incrementally also block joy so your capacity to feel and have pleasure in life mm. is diminished at a time when you kind of need to get as much pleasure as you can and so you, yeah, we all know those that. women who are kind of a bit angry a bit difficult yes nothing really pleases them um and they're never sort of satisfied and that that's because they've built these kind of walls of defences that don't let anything in. So you've but, got to let the pain in to be able yes. to allow the joy at the other end of the scale. Let it through your system, support yourself in it. And, you know, in my book, I won't go now, there are lots of things that help you to support mm -hmm. yourself through it. Mm. And then you do come out the other side. Yes. And often with some people, it can feel like they... You know, they talk about their new selves or their different selves or their, you know, and, and that can be a positive thing and they really thrive. Yes. And then practical aspects. Do you do you cover in your work practical aspects like making sure that you get enough sleep and supporting yourself with good nutrition? And we spoke about the importance of exercise for mental health. All of those things. So everything that goes into your system affects your mood so what you watch what you listen to who you see what you eat what you drink when you go to bed how much you move your body how much you don't move your body every part of it you know our mind and body are completely interconnected yeah. will affect our mood and what we want is balance um you know so if you're really miserable don't watch horrible frightening films <laughs> you know it's just this basic thing isn't yeah. it? but it actually it's, it's listening to happy music perks you up yes you know music affects your mood but you may be wanting to listen to sort of suicide slash your wrist music yeah. and that will make you feel worse when really you should be listening either to calming music yeah or stuff that makes you want to you know lifts your mood yeah and is the bottom line really all about being able to manage change and, and recognizing that we live in this state of change the whole time and not being af afraid of change but recognizing yes it. That you've ex exactly said my words, that if we allow ourselves to face change and adapt and go through its process, which has its own time, then we do thrive and we grow. And the research shows that those that don't change have less joy and less success in life. And when change hits them again, they find it even harder. Mm. Um, but the thing that people mind about most, ultimately, when they look back at their life, is their love and connection to others. So that's the thing that you really need to work on through through that all these different phases and stages of life. Through life. I love that. We're going to end on that because that is such a great thought to hold to really encourage and foster our love and connection to others. It is. Brilliant. Julia, thank you so much and huge luck with the book. It's brilliant. Thank you, thank you very much for being with us. A real pleasure to meet you, Liz. Thank, thank you. And that's it for today's episode. As always, you will find all the links and the resources mentioned on today's show over on lizalwellbeing.com. And there you can also sign up for my free weekly newsletter, jam-packed with well-being wisdom and behind-the-scenes treats. Huge thanks to all of you who've left us such lovely reviews. Thank you. It really does help others to find the show. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye-bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière. <laughs>